Would you pray with me? Father, we come before you in that word. Lord, hallelujah. Praise be to God. Hallel. The praise of God in joyous song. In the midst of our trials and our tragedies and our difficulties, Lord, in the darkest night, sometimes the only word we have is hallelujah. Indeed, a word that is enough. Father, it is our prayer today. Hallelujah. Amen. Around the mid-1300s, A Scottish man by the name of Alexander married a woman whose father was one of the wealthiest men on the planet at the time. Her father had made his fortune and living off the back of his father and his father who had all been tradesmen. They had traded things around the world. They had moved goods from one city and one region and one country to another. Over the next two centuries, the family created in this union would grow into one of the most influential and respected houses in all of Ireland. They were known as the House Castlereagh. The House Castlereagh had a large and lavish castle that for generations served the family's interest and served as their headquarters. It was one of the crowning jewels of all of Ireland. It had been built over hundreds of years in pieces and added onto and made larger and larger as the family's fame and influence and wealth grew. But eventually, for multiple reasons and what is a long story, as tends to be the case, this family, the Castlereys, lost their prominent place in history. And along with losing their prominence, they lost their wealth. Eventually their wealth dwindled to the point where they were no longer able to occupy the castle and keep it staffed. The family eventually all one by one moved away to other places to do other things. And the castle lay there dormant. It lay vacant, closed up and shuttered in For many, many years, it was forgotten. With each passing generation of castle rays that passed away, someone would inherit the castle, but no one ever did anything with it. Now, for those of you who've traveled with me to the other side of the world, to places like the Holy Land in Jerusalem or anywhere really in that region, Greece, Italy, or the other places on our Bible tours, one of the common things we learn on those tours is that in these older days, these past centuries, it was not uncommon for people to come along and scavenge the stones of buildings to build other buildings. They would come along to vacant buildings and scavenge those stones of the abandoned buildings to build their own buildings. In fact, on our recent trip to Rome, we saw how this happened even to the great Roman Colosseum as it lay dormant and vacant in the heart of Rome. At one point in its history, the Roman citizens began to scavenge the stones and the metal and the other things off of that huge Colosseum. Such was the case for the Castlereagh Castle. The castle ray who had inherited the castle last happened to be in the region and decided to drop by and see the old estate, which he had always intended to fix up and move back into. He was appalled whenever he arrived to discover that the locals had started to rob the stones from the castle. They had started to rob those stones and use them in their own homes and their own businesses, to build their own structures. This castle ray was determined to save his castle. And so he found a local mason and asked him to build a wall, a tall wall, around the entire castle to seal it in and to protect it from the scavengers. 
This was going to be a significant project that would take several years to complete, and it would come at great expense, this wall. So this mason and this castle ray had extensive negotiations, and finally a price was agreed upon, and castle ray departed to tend to his affairs and other places in the world. Some three years passed when Castlereagh returned to make inspection of his castle and to start its restoration and hopefully to move his family back into the estate. But when he arrived, he found that the wall had been completed to the exact height and the exact specifications he had ordered. But there was a problem. The castle was gone. What was once the, one of the crowning jewels of all of Ireland had utterly vanished into thin air. Upon closer inspection of the wall, Castlereagh noticed that the fine stones in this fine wall were the very stones that had once been in his castle. He summoned the mason and demanded an answer. Castlereagh yelled, Castlereagh cussed, Castlereagh fussed. And then he said, you, sir, destroyed my castle. To which the mason replied, you hired me to build a wall. <laughs> you did not pay me to cut the stones, only to build the wall. And why then, good sir, should I travel all over Ireland to cut new stones when the finest stones in all the land were right here next to me while I built your wall? So there it was. What was once a great castle had been exchanged for something much lesser, a wall. And a wall no less that protected nothing at all. Now you say, now pastor, why would you tell me such a story? What does this have to do with my life or with me or with our text for this day? My friends, I fear many of us, perhaps most of us, are doing something equally foolish with our lives. Our mistake does not involve a castle or a wall. Instead, it involves our lives and our souls. In our text today from Matthew chapter 16, we will consider another question from our Savior. The question is this, for what will it benefit someone if he gains the whole world yet loses his life? And Jesus provides a second similar question on the heels of that one when he says, or what will anyone give in exchange for his life? What we must consider today, church, is if we are robbing what is the castle of our lives, the castle of Christ, to build walls that when completed will protect nothing and serve no purpose at all. We shall see in our text that there are five great exchanges that all disciples of Jesus must make. We will see with great clarity as we begin through this passage of Scripture in verse 24 that there are five exchanges you will have to make in your life if you want to preserve the castle. Matthew 16, 24, for context, we begin here. It says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. For what will it benefit someone if he gains the whole world yet loses his life? Or what will anyone give in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will reward each according to what he has done. All five points today are not to be taken as a word of warning as much as they are a word of encouragement for your life. Each of them finds its root in our big idea, which I believe is the big idea of this text. The big idea is this, that as disciples of Jesus, 
We should always examine what we are exchanging. We should always examine what we are exchanging. If we don't examine what we're exchanging, what happens is as we drift through this life, we run the great risk of finding ourselves in the end with a wall without a castle. My first encouragement for you today is this. You must make the choice and the decision to exchange self for the Savior. Self for the Savior. No one has to teach us to be selfish. We come by it quite naturally, don't we? It's a part of our fallen flesh. Reminds me of a story I once heard about two young boys. Their names were Tom and Ryan. Their mom was preparing for them one Saturday morning some pancakes. Tom was five and Ryan was three at the time. And the boys began to argue over who would get the first pancake off of Mama's griddle. Their mother, seeing an opportunity for a moral lesson and being the wise woman and godly woman that she was, said, now boys, if Jesus were sitting here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake, I can wait. To which Tom, without missing a beat, turned to his younger brother, and said, Ryan, you be Jesus. (laughs) It's about right, isn't it? It's probably why the Bible has so much to say about selfishness. Paul speaks highly of young Timothy in Philippians chapter 2, noting that there is no one else like him. Noting that he is different, set apart, and unlike everyone else, particularly because he is not selfish. And instead, he is a man focused on the Savior. In Philippians 2, 19, now I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be encouraged by news about you. For I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care about your interests. He says in verse 21, all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ, but you know his proven character because he has served me in the gospel ministry like a son with a father. Church, can I encourage you this morning? In a world full of Toms, I pray that you and I as disciples of Jesus will choose to be Timothy's. I pray we will exchange selfishness and our own interest for those of Jesus Christ. There's a great warning about how important this exchange is, a great warning about how important this decision is for disciples of Jesus. In Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 4, it says, Or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. Because of your hardened and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath, he says, for yourselves in the day of wrath. When God's righteous judgment is revealed, he will repay each one according to his works. Look at verse 7, eternal life to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, but wrath and anger to those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth while obeying unrighteousness. There will be affliction and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew and also to the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does what is good first to the Jew and also to the Greek, for there is no favoritism with God. It is not easy to exchange the love of ourselves for the will of our Savior, I will admit. It is not easy to exchange selfishness for the Savior, but it is, my friends, necessary if we want to have a castle and not just a wall. For each time we choose selfishness over the Savior and we fail to make that exchange, we are robbing the castle to build something lesser that will not matter at all in the end because the castle will be robbed of everything and come up missing 
And we too will be left with only a wall. This is why Jesus starts by reminding us here in our text in verse 24. It's why he encourages us to make this great exchange of self for the Savior in saying, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself. Let him exchange himself for me. The word deny here means to utterly disown, abandon, and renounce. It is one of the strongest terms possible in the language. It implies a complete rejection of one's own desires and ambitions in favor of the will of God. You remember the question that Jesus asks in our text? For what will it benefit someone if he or she gains the whole world yet loses his life? My friends, we must always examine what we are exchanging. Verse 24 points us to the second of these five great exchanges. Not only the encouragement to exchange our selfishness for our Savior, but also that we would exchange our comfort for the cross. My friends, there is no comfort to be had on the cross. There is no comfort to be had there on the timber. The cross is raw. The cross is rough. The cross is painful. The cross is exhausting. The cross is humiliating. The cross is costly. But you know what else the cross is? The cross is transformative. The cross is redemptive. The cross is victorious. The cross is freedom. The cross is love. The cross is grace. The cross is eternal hope. You can have comfort or you can have the cross, but you cannot have both. Always examine what you are exchanging Look at the second part of verse 24. Then Jesus saying to his disciples, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, yes, but number two, let him take up his cross and follow me. Church, I will admit this is a difficult exchange. Comfort is always the easier choice. The cross is always the much harder and much, difficult, much more difficult choice. Choosing the cross builds a castle. Choosing comfort builds a wall. A life of comfort might prove to be easy, but only the cross will prove to be eternally significant. Always examine what you are exchanging. There's a third great exchange here in our text. The exchange of control for commitment. It seems that commitment is something we see less and less in our world today. Can I get a witness? Amen. We live in a world where people are just generally less committed today than ever before. I mean, some of y'all are committed to the Dallas Cowboys. I have no <laughs> earthly idea why. You'll be committed to that. <laughs> but... In general, we're committed a lot less to most things. We see less commitment than ever to our jobs and our careers and our companies. Less commitment today to those things than ever before in the history of the world. We see less commitment to and in our communities. We see less commitment to our children's education. We see less commitment in our churches. We see less commitment in our Bible reading and our sharing of the faith and the gospel of Jesus to the lost and dying world that surrounds us. Just in general, we see commitment going away, don't we? But there are still great examples of commitment all around us. Can we celebrate one of those real quick? The most obvious way to celebrate commitment is through marriage. If you're married, would you just stand up with your spouse real quick? Can we honor them with a hand clap and just praise God for their commitment to each other? Stay standing. Stay standing. 
And here's what I want to do. I want you to stay standing for just a second. If you have been married for less than 10 years, praise God, that's great, it's wonderful, but you ain't done much yet, you can sit down. <laughs> praise God, we're, we're, we're praying for you. If you've been married less than 20 years, would you sit down? Okay, less than 30? Some of y'all are starting to do the math. You see that this game we're playing, <laughs> trying to figure out who's been married the longest. If you've been married less than 35 years, would you sit down? Okay, we're weeding it down. Less than 40 years, sit down. Now, y'all look around. These, these people here standing have been married more than 40 years. Praise God. How, how about 45 years? If you've been less, married less than 45, you can sit. Oh, we're getting on up there. 50? Do we have some 50? If less than 50, you can sit. Some of y'all are getting right up on it. Look at this. Woo! Praise God. Can we give them a round of applause? 50 years? 50 years. All right. Let's, maybe I'll slow down. 52 years or less, you can sit down. Okay, 55 years or less, sit down. Two couples left. How many years? How many? 57. 56. Praise God. 57, 56 years. Praise God. Y'all can be seated. You know what I want to do? I just want to pray for our marriages right now. Can we do that? Let's pray. Father, we come before you, Lord. I thank you for each and every couple that just stood Father, these couples who have made these commitments to each other and held on to them for years, for decades, Lord, for some approaching a generation. Father, for these who stood and show us what commitment looks like for 56 and 57 years, Lord, we use them as our examples. Father, we use them as an opportunity today to rejoice and seeing with our own eyes that commitment still exists. Amen. Father, may you help us to hold on to our commitments. May you bless these marriages that were represented here in your house today. Amen. Reminds me of something I once heard of a couple who was celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary, the person interviewing them asked them the reason for their long and happy marriage. The husband responded first, and he said, I have tried to never be selfish. After all, there is no I in the word marriage. The wife said, for my part, I have never corrected my husband's poor spelling. <laughs> Praise God wisdom right there. <laughs> Consider what Jesus offers us in verse 25. Look at this. This exchange, this exchange of control for commitment. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. Jesus says if you try to save it, if you attempt to control it, if you attempt to manipulate it, if you grasp it so tight and so hard in your fist as an effort to hold on to it, what happens is you end up losing it. He says the secret is to, to let go of it, to give up control of it, to loosen your grip of it, and to let God guide you and to let God lead you. To be committed to his will more than your own. That's where you find true life, according to Jesus. Paul, the Apostle Paul, was one who knew what it was to let go and to give God authority and control over his life. He knew what it was to be committed. Near the end of his life, he wrote this back to the Philippians in Philippians 3. Verses 7 through 11, but everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, he says, I consider everything to be a loss 
in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I consider them as dung, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. I don't know about y'all, but when I examine my own life, in the light of that verse, I must admit I am not there yet. I have some work to do. But I do realize when I read verses like that that there is a great exchange taking place. A great exchange that I must confront in my own personal life if I am to be like Jesus. A great exchange that is outlined here in verse 26 of our text which is indeed the question that Jesus poses. For what will it benefit someone if he gains the whole world and yet loses his life? Or what will anyone give in exchange for his life? Point number four, a gain of godliness or a gain of earthly goods. What are you exchanging? Are you going to exchange earthly gain for heavenly godliness or not? What will you give up? What did Lord Castlereagh gain from his exchange? What did he gain from exchanging a beautiful castle for a wall? Could the wall be restored into a great castle again? Perhaps but not without great expense, not without great time spent. It had taken generations to build that castle the first time, and it would again should they undertake such a task. It would take great effort on all accounts to do it, and so he simply sighed and walked away from both his castle and his wall. History says it was never rebuilt Jesus asked these two questions, which are both aimed at the same thing. What are you willing to exchange? For what will it benefit someone if he gains the whole world yet loses his life? Or what will anyone give in exchange for his life? What would you exchange? Let me ask you a question. This isn't a trick question. It's just a question. I don't have the money, so this is just a fake question, okay? But if I were to offer you $50 million for free, no strings attached, you can use it any way you want, there's only one condition, one condition, one string, everything else you can do. The the one condition is this, you have to spend it and use it before you die. You can't give it to anybody. You can't pass it along. You can spend it on other people, but but you can't can't pass any of it on. It has to all be used in your lifetime. It can only be used by you. How many of you would take the 50 million? Okay, half of us. I think the rest of you are liars. It's not good to lie in church. (laughs) It's not. It's not good, but... Another sermon, come back next week. We'll work on that. Now, what if I were to add a second condition to the same question? What if I were to add this one additional tiny stipulation? What if I told you that you would only have one day to spend it? That by accepting the $50 million, you would, in exchange for the $50 million, give up your life in 24 hours? 24 hours from the moment you took the $50 million, your life would end and be over. How many of you would take it? Not a one of us. Because in light of that, who cares how much money you have, right? It's not worth it. It's not worth the exchange. This is the point Jesus is getting at in verse 26. For what will it benefit someone if he gains the whole world? 
but loses his life? Or what will anyone give in exchange for his life? You wouldn't exchange your life for $50 million. But are you exchanging it for even lesser things? You see, exchanging any kind of earthly gain in the place of eternal godliness is a silly exchange. It's like taking the magnificent walls of a castle and building a wall around nothing. It's why I keep telling you, we as believers, as disciples, we've got to always examine what we are exchanging. There is no earthly gain that is worth sacrificing godliness for. Church, always choose godliness over earthly gain. For any time you choose gain over godliness, you are robbing stones from your castle and putting it on a wall that will not matter once the castle is gone. Number five, the final exchange in our text, we must exchange judgment for joy. Judgment for joy. Judgment, (laughs) judgment is interesting, isn't it? How many of you like to be judged? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> one, one guy here, he's like to be judged. I don't know. Got a sermon for you next week, too. <laughs> judgment. Ju- I don't like judgment. Most of us don't. We don't like to be judged, but we sure like to do the judging, don't we? <laughs> Isn't that the funny thing about judgment? None of us like to be judged, but we are sure quick to do the judging. Don't you think that's a little strange? We all hate judgment unless we're the one acting as the judge. It was F.B. Meyer, I believe, who, who once said that when we see a brother or a sister in sin, there are three things we do not know. He says, first, we do not know how hard he or she tried to not sin. He says, second, we do not know the power or the forces that assailed him or her into sinning. And he says, third, and perhaps most importantly, we do not know what we ourselves would have done in the same circumstances under the same powers and forces. If we all remembered that, we might just be a little bit slower to judge and quicker to forgive, wouldn't we? We might be slower to judge and quicker to encourage. We might be slower to judge and quicker to pray for our beloved. We might be slower to judge and quicker to embrace them with compassion. It was Jesus who said, do not judge in Matthew chapter 7. Do not judge so that you won't be judged, Jesus said. For you will be judged by the same standard in which you judge others, and you will be measured by the same measure you use. Why do you look at the splinter in your brother's eye and not notice the beam of wood in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the splinter out of your eye, and look, there's a beam of wood in your own eye? Hypocrite, he says, first take the beam of wood out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. Romans 14 reminds us that we should stop worrying so much about judging others, and instead we should remember that a day is coming when we ourselves will stand before God to be judged. In Romans 14, 12, and 13, it says, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us no longer judge one another. Instead, decide never to put a stumbling block or a pitfall in the way of your brother or sister. To the Corinthians, Paul wrote these words in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. You see, that day will come. But when it does, for those of us who die in Christ, we are promised there will be no condemnation. Romans 8, 1 and 2. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ. Christ Jesus, because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Oh, what joy there is in our salvation. Oh, what joy there is in our Savior, Jesus. 
Oh, it is the joy of God that builds castles, and it is the judgment of men that exchanges their castle for a wall. In verse 27 of our text, Jesus said these words that should bring us all great joy, for the Son of Man is going to come. Praise God. Let me say it again, because I don't think y'all heard it. For the Son of Man is going to come. Praise God. And he's going to come with his angels and the glory of his Father, and then he will reward each according to what he has done. Church, Jesus is alive. Jesus is coming back. And when he does, there will be both justice and joy. Justice and divine judgment for those who tore down their castle and exchanged them for a worthless wall. And joy for those who chose to repent of their sins. Joy for those who chose to be cleansed and redeemed and transformed by the blood of Jesus. Joy for those who took the time and were diligent enough to examine what they were exchanging as they walked through this life. The title of this message is The Great Exchange. We've come so far, now we have finally arrived at the moment where we can discover what the great exchange is. We haven't even touched on it yet. There is a great exchange, the greatest exchange of all time. It was an exchange between death and life. It was an exchange between darkness and light. It was an exchange of slavery for freedom. There is a great exchange, it's an exchange of spiritual rags for spiritual riches, an exchange of hell for heaven, an exchange of sin and salvation. It happened not in a castle, but up on a hill called Calvary. It was an exchange not of stone, but an exchange of flesh and blood. There on that day, God exchanged his sinless son for the life of every sinner, including you and me. There on Calvary, God exchanged his sinless lamb for the lost sheep of his kingdom. Yes, it was there on Calvary on that day that that exchange was made, the greatest exchange in all of history, an exchange that was so violent the earth trembled, an exchange that was so great that the day turned to darkness and the curtain was torn in the temple Graves were flung open in that hour. The devil was defeated. Death was conquered. And eternal hope for all humanity was born because of that great exchange on Calvary. There has never been, nor will there ever be, such an exchange again as there was on that day, on that hill, just outside the walls of Jerusalem. And the question is, why would God make such an exchange? Well, because he loves you. John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, for God loved the world in this way. He gave, he exchanged his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Church Christ is our castle. Let us not exchange such a precious and holy and magnificent gift of grace for worthless walls Amen. that will protect nothing should we sacrifice the castle for the wall. If you are here this day and you have never exchanged your sin for the freedom that comes through the blood of Jesus, we offer you that exchange. Not from this church, not from this pulpit, not from this man, but from the one who died for you on the cross, on the timber. Give your life to him. Repent, be saved, cry out, call out. Believe and know him today as your Lord and Savior and know that your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. Inherit the castle that was bought for you on Calvary. 
And then do not exchange its precious stones for anything less. Let us pray. If that's you and you can hear my voice and you desire to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this day to inherit the kingdom of God, to be saved by and under the only name which you can be saved, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we don't ask you to raise a hand, to rise to your feet. I do not ask you to pray out loud, to walk an aisle, to meet me at the back. I only ask that you bow your heart and your head in humble repentance before your God. And say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. And so I ask now by faith that you would change me. Lord, I ask by faith that you would save me. I ask by faith that you would transform me and perform inside of me a great spiritual exchange. Death to life. Darkness to light. Father, that you would exchange my sin for the salvation you bought for me on Calvary. Lord, I thank you for your grace and for your goodness, for your love and for your mercy. Father, we are grateful for those who have called on you. And Lord, we are grateful for the inheritance of the kingdom and the castle which was bought with your blood. Father, we are even more grateful that you forgive us when we exchange those precious stones for worthless walls. Let us be encouraged this day to inhabit the castle, not scavenge it. To embrace it, Lord, not to embark on tearing it down with things of this world that end up being worthless in the end. Lord, help us to all examine what we exchange. We ask, we pray, and we beseech you now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Hey, this is Pastor Pete. Thanks so much for watching this sermon from Cowboy Fellowship. We hope you enjoy it. I want to ask you, if you don't mind, be sure you hit the subscribe button, the like button, and then leave a comment, an encouraging word down below. All three of those things are so encouraging to us. They also help with the YouTube algorithm and help us as we're trying to get the good news out to the world. Thanks for watching this video. Thanks for being a part of our online family. We pray God blesses you today.